that, uh, is that on? Does that sound good? I think you're good. All right. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be here this evening, to be here for your 60th anniversary of this very well-known church in our metropolis. And I'll tell you, coming from St. Mary's in Minneapolis, we actually have a very warm, long-term relationship with this parish for a couple of reasons. One, many decades ago, when I was a young man in the 70s, many of your children came to our summer camp. And so everybody always couldn't wait for the Chicago kids to be bussed up to our summer camp at that time. And secondly, because you have one of our own as your head priest. I grew up with Father Rick. We've known each other since we're young men, and in fact, he was the same age as my younger sister. So tonight, we are going to take a look at the verse in Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even in our suffering, we're going to add that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, even in our suffering. There is enormous suffering going on today in our land. Suffering in our families, suffering in our workplaces, suffering with our friends, our communities, the country, and in this case, even the entire world. So we're going to look at this topic of suffering and how we look at it as Orthodox Christians and what we can do with all of this suffering. So I'm going to start with my own story. And this took place a long time ago when I was eight years old. I was having some trouble seeing. My parents noticed, and they took me down to the University of Minnesota to have my eyes checked out. And we received, my parents and I, a devastating diagnosis. And that was that I had a rare genetic eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa, or RP for short. And the doctors told us that this disease would lead to blindness and that there is no cure as of now. It was devastating. The two main characteristics of this disease are night blindness, so when it's dark, I can't see anything. And that started when I was very young, four, five, six. I can remember friends staying out for night games, and I'd go home. I just didn't understand how they could stay out. And the other part is tunnel vision. So if you put your hands up to your head and kind of make binoculars and just slowly tighten those binoculars, slowly, slowly, until all you can see is just a little bit of light. And that's what I can see today, a little bit of light. And by the way, that changes everything. Just a little bit of light, like uh, up over here. Okay. So this began a period of some very intense emotional, sometimes physical, spiritual suffering in my life. It was really scary. School became difficult. We didn't have many of the services or technology that we have today, thank God. But back then, we didn't have that. So I found myself falling behind academically. And I just sort of assumed, well, maybe I'm just stupid. OK, I can, I can accept that. Then I would have peer teasing. Because in gym class and things of this nature, I just couldn't quite keep up. And I can remember many times crying myself to sleep. Why me, Lord? My brothers don't have this. My sister doesn't have this. My friends don't have this. Why me? My sight began to deteriorate very quickly. They thought I would actually be totally blind by the time I was 15. That wasn't the case, thank God. I was legally blind. I couldn't drive, of course. 
And by the time I entered into high school, I couldn't really read without significant magnification. As I entered into high school, two important things happened as I reflect back in my life. Number one is I started to develop some very serious fear and anxiety about the future. And truthfully, these were very legitimate fears. How am I going to go to college? My friends were talking about college. Who would ever hire a blind person? How am I ever going to have a job? What woman would ever marry me? And how could I ever be a dad? But at the same time, something started to happen at church at St. Mary's. Presbyterian Mary Canaris, my high school Sunday school teacher, every week told us how much God loves us. And that if we open our heart to him, he will work out his plan, a plan, some plan, with you. He'll work out a plan with you. And at first, of course, I thought she was crazy. And then I started to say, well, what if it's true? And so for you Sunday school teachers, or I understand Angela, your new youth director, or parents that work with the youth, you do not know the impact you may have years down the road. The second thing that happened to me is I was introduced to the verse in Romans, Romans 5, 3 through 5. For we rejoice in our suffering, for suffering brings endurance, endurance brings character, and character brings hope. And St. Paul says, and hope does not disappoint. We rejoice in our suffering. That's hard because it brings endurance, godly character, and hope. And hope does not disappoint. So somehow, in the spiritual life, we believe that our hardships, our disappointments, somehow lead to growth and healing and spiritual development inside of us. And I will tell you, I needed that hope. Because, as I mentioned, I am totally blind, basically, now, with the exception of just a little bit of light. You know, every world religion tries to deal and has a view towards suffering. It's really interesting to study. Because human suffering happens everywhere. So for the Buddhist or for the Hindu, Suffering is to be avoided at all costs. In fact, it's really the goal of their path. That if I can get rid of all of my desires, then I will detach from everything because desire brings suffering. And if I can get rid of that, I will have no suffering and I will absorb up into the universe, into nirvana, and I will not be reincarnated. For the Muslim or the Jew, it tends to be a little bit more about a test or a punishment. And even in some Christian confessions called the prosperity gospel, the view would be that if you have enough faith, you will have less suffering. And you may even be blessed materially here on earth. So in these confessions, suffering is something to be avoided, to run from. And you know, our American culture, we pretty much follow these confessions. We really are taught to either avoid or bury or maybe even numb our suffering. But the Lord, the scriptures, 
The church does not teach us that. We know from the funeral service that we believe that it isn't until eternal life where there will be no pain, sorrow, or suffering. And so we know we will experience suffering. We get an experience of the kingdom here, but we're yet still not in that kingdom. And so, while in the meantime we have suffering, we somehow believe with the Lord, somehow transformation and healing can actually take place. We see this with our Lord. He did not run from his suffering. In the garden of Gethsemane, he faced it face to face. Lord, remove this cup, he says, but not my will, thy will be done. Or we see in the liturgical services of the church, in Vespers, or during pre-sanctified liturgy during Lent. Hear me, Lord. Hear me, Lord. It's like the psalmist is crying out, Lord, I can't take it, Lord. Help me, Lord. Be with me, Lord. Or the beautiful paraclesis that we do for the two weeks of August, or the monasteries around the world do every day to the Theotokos, where we over and over bring our wounds our concerns, our physical ailments, our spiritual ailments for healing. Or even tonight, I thought, while we were in this beautiful, incredible, powerful service, the entire service dedicated to the suffering of our soul and our body. And here, by the way, we would have to say we are also different than these other confessions. Go back and reread these prayers. When you go home, you can go on goarch.org and read them. Over and over, the prayers call for the forgiveness of our sins, our repentance, and for the holistic healing of soul and body. I can even remember, especially when I was in high school, and I started to grow spiritually, I started to go to the, these. This was my absolute favorite service. I really believed the Lord would heal my eyes. Over and over, it was my highlight. And of course, that didn't happen. But as I got older, I started to realize that he was doing more important healing. And I still need that more important healing of the soul. So even liturgical life teaches this, that holistically, we need to cry upon the Lord. It's important we know we can and need to cry upon the Lord. We all face suffering. We have kind of, we could call it communal suffering with this incredible pandemic all around the world. We're in it together. We have mutual suffering here. And of course, the sort of divisive politics we have, we're all suffering through together. We also have a lot of our own suffering, or in our families. It could be relationship stress suffering. It could be physical ailment stress suffering. Death of a loved one stress suffering. Divorce stress suffering. Mental illness, addiction. The list goes on and on. How about our clergy? Not only do they have to deal with their own suffering for them and their families, but also the suffering of all of the flock. Sometimes it can just feel like it's too much. But with the Lord's help, it is not. It is not too much. St. Maximus the Confessor, who lived in the late 500s, early 600s, has one of my absolute favorite quotes on suffering. And it goes like this. I'll summarize. When God became man, he suffered in the flesh. 
We know that. So when we suffer, should we not rejoice? This shared suffering confers the kingdom on us. In his compassion and his love for every one of us, he mysteriously suffers with us with the exact same suffering that we are experiencing until the end of time. He mysteriously suffers with us with the exact same suffering that we are experiencing till the end of time. Can you imagine? He is suffering with you and me today. He was suffering with me when I was a young boy, and I didn't even know it. I didn't know how to open my heart when I was very young that way. So somehow, as we open our heart and let the Lord suffer with us, things begin to happen. Somehow, good comes. So let me get back to my story. Those fears that I had, which were very legitimate, turned out to be fears. Like many of our fears, most of them really never were going to happen in the first place. Of course, some do. God does give us fear to protect ourselves, but most don't. I was able to go to college. It was amazing. 300 volunteers at that time. There was no technology back in that time in 1980. 300 volunteers read three hours a week for people like me and put them into cassette tapes. For, for you young ones, those are like, uh, uh, it's like a, di like a digital thing, sort of, but it was on a tape. <laughs> I was able to have readers read my tests. It was a miracle I was able to graduate. I was able to get work. I was able to be married. And I'm married to an incredible woman, Cindy. And I have three precious children, Peter, Anna, and Joseph. How blessed am I? My work life, which I truly was afraid if I could have a full-time job, blossomed. I worked and I worked and I worked. I was in the investment industry. I made a few good investment recommendations, and I was recruited to New York at a very young age, in my 20s. And after five years of intense battling, I actually became the number one ranked airline analyst in the world for five straight years and named the, the youngest partner at that time at one of the three global investment banks in the world. From a worldly perspective, I really experienced it all. First class travel, five star hotels, five star restaurants, every major TV show you could ever imagine. I was there as the airline expert, CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, Good Morning America, The Today Show. I'd be picked up by a limo, brought to Rockefeller Center, brought to the green room, which is where they put all the makeup on you, and then be brought out on the set to talk about airline strategy, airline marketing, who's going to win, who's going to lose. It was really exciting, and what a blessing. But then, after many, many years of doing this, in 1995, after being in 27 cities in 29 days, which was something we did on a pretty regular basis, the last seven of which were in Europe, I had had a great day of business in Amsterdam, presenting the thesis on the industry, which stocks you should buy, which stocks you should sell, why. And I went to go to bed that night in this beautiful, Beautiful bed, one of those big poster beds, you know, with the canopy and the fluffy pillows. And I laid my head back on that pillow. And suddenly, I began to weep. And weep. 
I literally cried for two straight hours. I didn't even know why I was crying. Everything started to become clear to me. My work was incredible, but every, ever, every other element of my life was compromised. My marriage, my health, my family, I ignored. My friendships, I ignored. And I realized I have nothing. My faith, which was always there, was way down on the priority list. And this breakdown, which one of my counselors said, no, this was a breakthrough, began to change my life. So is this what St. Paul is talking about when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Well, for me, a little yes and a little no. Yes, because I really do believe that my suffering brought me far more endurance and strength. Having a good work ethic is very godly. The scriptures, the fathers, are very pro-work. So working hard, using our talents, providing for the needs of our families, doing our jobs with excellence, this is all on the path toward Christ. On the other hand, no. Because Christ was way down my priority list, and I was detaching my work from my faith. And the impact to myself and to those closest to me was very significant. Thankfully, the Lord did not abandon me. And I've been rebuilding ever since. And my last 25 years have been much more healthy and balanced. Although, as you all know, that's a constant, constant spiritual struggle. So I think it's important that we look at what does St. Paul mean when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, we can learn a lot and infer a lot by the book itself. He wrote the book of Philippians from a prison. And we know the prisons in those days were absolutely brutal. So it's very clear he was not talking about worldly success, reputation, accomplishments, luxurious experiences. No, clearly not. But what maybe was he referring to. In the same chapter, he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, whatever is of virtue and is praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Whatever is True, noble, just, pure, lovely, virtuous, praiseworthy. Meditate on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So he's talking about this movement toward theosis, toward becoming holy, becoming people of sacrifice, humility, love, endurance, character, and hope to become Christ-like. This is, I can do all things. Wow. That's wow. And of course, there's a place for our work. There's a place for our relationships. There's a place for everything. But this is the do all things. So lastly, 
I'd like to just explore with you what happens when we don't face our suffering face to face, when we ignore it, or when we bury it, or when we numb it. And I see this in my own life and with the people that I do Orthodox life coaching with. It has real impact to us. When we have suffering and we say, ah, it's okay, ah, forget about it, I can handle it, ah, big deal. No. David doesn't do this in the Psalms, does he? He brings every emotion to the Lord. And the Lord faced his suffering face to face. When we don't, wounds get impacted in our soul. And it was not something that I had to hear all the talk about the wounds, the healing of the wounds, soul and body. These wounds, you can call them logosmi, that's the Greek word, or the thought wounds. We can literally start to believe there's nothing good down there. The image of God, I don't have an image of God in me. I guess I'm just a failure. Or I am just inadequate. Or if I'm not perfect, there'll be a consequence. Or if they see the real me, if they see the real me, they will reject me. Whoa. No. The Lord creates everybody in the image of God. And no image is ever wiped out. And everyone has the chance to grow in, in potential to his likeness from wherever we're starting. And so the fathers tell us that we will take one of two paths when this stuff is down there, these wounds. One is the sensual pleasure path, or you could call it temporary pleasure. And it's things that bring a, a temporary feel-good. So it's an excess of food, or drink, or sex, or chasing money, or maybe even people-pleasing. It feels really good to be liked. The problem is, is they're temporary. They feel good for a moment, but they don't heal our soul. They don't bring internal peace and comfort. The other, because these wounds down there hurt, lead us down a path that life isn't fair. Anger, blame, blame for my hurt. And we may really were, we maybe really were hurt, by the way. Sometimes we really do get hurt. Blame for my circumstances, resentment toward my situation or the people that have caused my situation, or maybe even despair. It will never get better. And here we will have to say that no matter how broken, no matter how damaged, no matter how much hurt we have, if we open our heart to the Lord, He will come in and begin the healing process. That healing oil that we receive tonight is for, yes, our bodies, but it's also for the wounds of our soul. What is our suffering? May we bring it to the Lord. May we cry out to him, Lord, I am hurting. Lord, I am confused. Lord, I'm angry. Lord, this person hurt me. Lord, I forgive, Lord. Help me forgive. I forgive, Lord. Help me forgive. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And in this way, somehow, mysteriously, he suffers with us, and we suffer with him. We become co-crucified with him. And then some kind of transformation and healing begins to take hold. And when healing takes hold in our heart, 
we begin to heal our families. We begin to heal our friends. We begin to heal our workmates, our neighbors, our communities, and yes, even the world. And in this way, we can, with St. Paul from prison, say, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Thank you, Paul, and uh, as always, very inspiring and meaningful, and uh, so nice to have you with us. Uh, we do have time for questions and answers, so what I would ask is if you could raise your hand, I'll recognize you. You could stand up, maybe pull your mask down and, and say your question as loudly and clearly as possible, and uh, hope, hopefully we can answer your question. Any questions? John? That's a great question. So the question, yeah, you want, you want to? Okay. So the question was, you know, thank you for the story. I, uh, John said that, you know, you've been working on this for a long time. What's it like now? Can you still uh, embrace your suffering? Can you still uh, call out to the Lord for your suffering? Has it, you know, has it healed? What's it like now today after this many years? You know, it's a constant struggle in life. But as we'll talk about tomorrow night, tomorrow night's talk, it, it's, a, it's a joyful struggle. And, you know, my, my suffering has shifted from when I was young to just begin to deal with the grieving of the loss of my sight and all that comes with that, the embarrassments, the you know, hardships of not being able to do certain things. And uh, you go through all the, the normal grieving of denial, not going to happen to me, and anger, uh, why me, Lord, uh, bargaining, maybe if I do this, Lord, you'll heal me, uh, sadness, this really stinks, and then acceptance. And you know, uh, I have accepted. That part of that suffering I have accepted. And uh, the, other the other things of my wounds are things like I'm stupid or I'm weird these kind of uh, distortions of our self-image that we all have, by the way, but some get really infected. And I had some pretty big infection ones. So as long as I was successful, I didn't have to worry about those things. And uh, it turns out success does not heal anything. Healing comes from the Lord and being around a community. Healing comes from the Lord and from being in community. And so, you know, now my suffering is more spiritual struggles, you know, passions that I struggle with. Uh, and, and that causes suffering too. This is why as Orthodox we say sin is a sickness. It's not you're a terrible rotten person. When we're sinning, it's a sickness. And this is why great spiritual fathers don't judge anybody. They look at them as somebody who is sick. And they need help. Wow. So, yes, you know, and suffering is something that uh, we'll always have. We get glimpses of no suffering. Oh, what a blessing. Then we can suffer with others, maybe. Because it's following the cross. It's what the Lord showed us to do. Pick up our cross and follow him. So it's a constant battle. And the, and the suffering sh changes. But he'll always be with us. He'll always be with us. Other questions?
Beautiful. And you, more? Did you have more on that? Okay. So the question was, what are my views on the Jesus prayer? You know, this is really a uh, time-tested practice of our faith. And um, I do practice the Jesus prayer. It is, uh, you know, there's even been secular studies now done out of the Danielson Institute in Boston where they did a study of people doing the Jesus prayer. 20 minutes a day for over 30 days. And they saw purely from a, this is a non-religious study, they saw statistical declines in anxiety, fear, and overall emotional health improved. Very interesting. And of course, there's been other studies done on meditation and things of this nature. It comes from the scriptures. Son of David, have mercy on me. The blind man, son of David, have mercy on me. And the publican, Lord, have mercy on me as he's bowing to the ground. And it starts very early in the church in the deserts of Egypt. And it's been maintained all these centuries. And it's not just for, for uh, monks and nuns, it's also for us. So there's different ways to practice it. A great book to read is The Art of Prayer. It's a beautiful book. Or Wounded by Love uh, about St. Porphyrius. He's got some very beautiful sections to do the Jesus prayer, maybe with some prostrations, if you can, in your prayer rule, for love for God. And we're not, you know, we don't, wherever we're doing our prayers, if we aren't praying with a prayer rule today of some kind, it's okay, just get started. Five minutes a day even. Doesn't have to be, you know, hours of prayer. We have busy lives, we have families, we got work, we got uh, kids, we've got all kinds of responsibilities. And so, but to have some time we are the church of prayer. We really are. And people are hungry right now. They're going to the east in a lot of the Buddhism and stuff. But we Orthodox, we have the, the, the silence. And so a little practice of silence can be life-changing. I wasn't doing silence really until maybe the last 12 years or so. Or, or, or so. And uh, it really is life-changing. It's just a part of our spiritual practices that opens our heart in themselves, they don't do anything, but when we open our heart, then God begins to do his work on us. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow night a little bit. So I hope that, that answers it. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, Stephanie, sorry. Uh, I want to So Stephanie said the first thing is that I was not going to be able to come because uh, normally this weekend we have our uh, family camp in the Twin Cities, Pan-Orthodox family camp that my wife Cindy uh, is one of the leaders on and I'm always by her side for that. And it got canceled because of COVID. So that is why we were able to come. So it was a blessing. And the question is, what does it look like when I say, uh, when I refer to that uh, asking the Lord to suffer with us? What does that look like? Oh, you know, I will tell you that um, I didn't really know that this was something to actually pray until the last many years. And uh, I was taught it by a spiritual mentor in the church. And, and now you'll see it in the Psalms, you'll see it everywhere, the St. Maximus quote, of course, where he says, this shared suffering that he mysteriously suffers with us with the exact same suffering. Do you know, one of the best ways I can 
express it is, you know when you're really hurting and somebody in your life who you're really close to, who just loves you unconditionally, and we don't have many of these people in our lives, right? Usually there's just a few. But, and you really feel they have that gift, that gift of compassion, and you just feel them like crying with you. And they cry with you. And somehow, that act is healing. Because they're with you. So it's, it's the same thing with the Lord. That in your prayer, to get that little silence, to even become aware of what are you really hurting about? What are you angry about? Who are you angry at? What, what is it that is really making you anxious? To bring that to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I just be honest with him. I can't take it. Be here with me, Lord. And let him cry with you. And it is, it is really powerful. I'll tell one story that, that really highlights it. In our prison ministry, Father Rick used to be our chaplain until he left us in the Twin Cities, which we miss him as our chaplain uh, of our prison ministry. Father Thomas Hopko, of blessed memory, who we all remember very well from St. Vladimir's, came to Minneapolis to lead our ministry on a retreat, and he, we got special approval for him to come into the prison. And he came in with us, and we had nine men sitting around the table with four or five of us volunteers and Father Tom. And the study was going on that night, and these are men really trying to change their life. And this one young man breaks down and shares with us. He had been in prison for over 20 years and that he committed murder. That he had killed his own father because his father kept abusing his mom. And the room was dead silent. And Father Hopko was the first to speak after about 30 seconds of complete silence. Nobody knew what to say. And he said, and the, and the young man was crying. He was about 40 years old, so he went in, he was around 20. He said, son, can I say something? And he said, yes. And he said, it's okay. Just keep weeping. Just keep weeping with the Lord there with you. Just keep weeping. And you will feel his presence. That's all he said. That was it. Nobody said a word. And then we moved on to a new topic. So we all have something, and it's heightened right now with the pandemic and all the stress in our country. So just to get a little silence, if you can take five minutes and just get yourself silent, do a few Jesus prayers, warm up your heart a little bit, do a few prostrations to get your body opened up a little bit, you know, five, whatever number that just calms your body down, open your heart. And when it comes up, just bring it to the Lord. And that can begin a process of healing. Okay? Other questions? Great question.
Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. So as Angela was saying, she was with the young kids at kindergarten through, I think, third grade. And uh, uh, she knew my daughter, Anna, from Crossroads, which we'll say hi to. That's wonderful. And um, that the kids asked, she said, we're going to go listen to a speaker who's uh, blind. And they, the kids said, well, are we going to unblind him? Oh, how's that for purity? Huh? Yeah. And so how are we supposed to talk about suffering to our young kids? This is a big one. And you know, part of our culture, as I mentioned, is to avoid or to bury or to numb our suffering. And uh, my kids are 22, 20, and 18. And I can tell you this is probably our biggest challenge as parents, is to actually let our kids suffer a little bit. It's OK. We want them to be people of endurance, character, and hope. So the challenge is, how do we come alongside them and yet let them work through it? Let them feel a little suffering, but knowing we're always there. Let them feel it, but know we're always there and that the Lord's there. And some suffering, the Lord heals. Some physical things, he does heal. There's gospel stories all over the place, even today, many miracles of healing throughout the life of the church. Physical healings, it's amazing. But sometimes, like St. Paul, where he said, remove this thorn in the flesh, there was some wound there. And the Lord said, after three times, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Because in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. So some things may not go away. But he will always heal holistically, inside and whatever outside is meant to be healed. And we really believe it's all to lead us toward growth. And so for kids to know that we are going to have hard times, and parents, a great thing to do is when your kid's really sad, is just go to your prayer corner with them, light a candle, sit down, and just say, Okay, you ought to go. You want to tell Jesus about your sadness? Or what, you're, what are you feeling? Do you want to tell him? I'm angry. I'm sad. Whatever they're feeling. Let them learn to tell the Lord, like David in the Psalms. It's, it's, it's a very powerful thing to do. Or they got teased at school. To not judge the teasers. To teach them how to protect themselves, but also not to judge or to be resentful, to forgive. So it were, it's a very powerful thing to bring them to your prayer corner, to sit down, to not, let, not try to fix the pain. Let them feel it, but to let them know that the Lord's with them. And let's start with ourselves. Because until we start to do it ourselves and have a little glimpse of that, and that the Lord does, and it turns this... this co-suffering with him is mutual. We experience his suffering, he experiences our suffering, as St. Maximus says, and then in that, that, that inner strength and joy and things start to develop. So I hope that helps, and thanks for your work with the kids. So, uh, I think we could probably go all night with questions, uh, and we do have another night, so I want to remind everybody uh, Paul will be with us for Vespers tomorrow and speaking again tomorrow evening, uh, taking it in a little bit different direction about being light to the world. And uh, if you haven't yet registered for tomorrow night, you certainly can still do so online and join us. Um, just to, if, if you allow me just a little bit of liberty to uh, answer Angela's question in a little different way, um, on unblinding, I would, I would I would say, knowing Paul, that uh, he has become unblind in many other ways versus physical blindness. Uh, Paul's, you, you would, I think, would say that your perceptions are, are much more magnified in many other uh, aspects than physical sight. And I think by listening to you tonight, many of you have become aware of that. But I do recall quite vividly our trip to Thessaloniki uh, nine years ago 
and visiting the Church of St. Demetrius and uh, walking into the church together, and you said, there's something over there. There's something over there. What's over there? Tell me what's over there. And it was the relics of St. Demetrius. And uh, so, so Paul has got a lot more sight than, than a lot of people. That was a moving experience. There was, there was, that was just a, a very moving, I thought it was the altar. I said, is that the altar? And they said, no, no, what were you? And I was pointing, it was, the, it was the relics. But I also remember, and you chanted the, his Trapanian tonight, with, with Father Rick being Demetrius, we sat, him and I, just the two of us, everybody, all the other priests had left, and we sat right in front of his relics in this little room, and he chanted as a priest of the Holy Church, the Trapanian to his saint in front of his relics. It was one of the most, mo I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. It was an incredible experience. Yeah, thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, Paul. We're, we're indebted to your offering this evening. So I'll have Cindy come up and uh, we'll, 